Jonathan Wilson from The Guardian joins us and really exciting because Jonathan has covered world football probably more extensively than any other English language writer uh, and uh, uh, including Eastern Europe, including Latin America. Uh, he's really kind of the definitive uh, English language uh, writer about Eastern European football and uh Brian Clough, uh, for me, the best Brian Clough biography was uh, uh, was was his and uh, coverage of, of Sunderland and uh, obviously inverting the pyramid and, and a regular on the Guardians uh, Football Weekly podcast. But now, uh, Jonathan, we're excited that you're going to be uh, writing a newsletter specifically for the U.S. audience. Uh, uh, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, that's right. So it's it started, I think, in July, might have been August. Um, but it, the the Guardian have now got a specific uh, US sports section within their sports website, and part of that is is to do a football newsletter, uh, trying to, to to reach, trying to talk to fans in the US. I, I guess it's entirely possible it will gain an audience beyond that. Hopefully, it will because you know the more the merrier. But it, the the idea is to. To, to try and uh, service you know, those the many readers the Guardian has in the US, um, so I, th- I think it started pretty well. I think um, I haven't seen any figures recently, but certainly August I think we had uh, ten million unique views, which oh, seems wow. like a big number to me. I know I know the US is a much bigger country than the UK, but that still sounds sounds like quite a large number. And I, I think I mean it, obviously it's a slightly false stat because we were starting from zero, but I think it was the quickest growing newsletter in the US, certainly. You know, August, September time. Fantastic. And have you found uh, writing on topics for the U.S. audience specifically is different than uh, the U.K. audience or other English language audiences? Because uh, uh, quite honestly, I, I know people in Italy who, who uh, read English that read your, your writing, uh, people in Germany, etc. Uh, have you found writing for the American audience is different or is it is football football? I, I mean, I, the way I see it, football is football. I, I guess it depends exactly what you're doing. But I've made, you know, I, I said, do you want me to try and use US English and you know, make the team singular? And they said, no, just just write naturally because otherwise you'll end, you know, end up like somebody trying to do an accent badly. Uh, <laughs> so I've written it as I would normally write. I, I noticed that occasionally the subs change things. I, I noticed that got became got. Uh, but uh, yeah, if, if that makes it really easier to be a US audience, well, fine, you know, that, that makes sense. Um, I, th- I think in terms of where, where it is targeted, where it is focused, is in terms of topics. Um, I, I think um, you know, whenever you're writing, you do have to be aware of, of the audience. And I think we're aware of the US audience. I mean, what we absolutely don't want to do is, is patronize them or, or, or speak down to an audience or suggest somehow that they know less than we do. But there will be specific parts of UK culture that you know, people in the US just won't, won't have heard of. So in my regular column on a Sunday, I might make passing reference to a British sitcom of the 1980s. There's no point in me doing that for a US audience because that reference is not going to be, uh, it's not going to land. Um, so you, you've got to be slightly broader in, in terms of uh, the jokes you make, the references you make. And I think one of the, one of the things we've done uh, is you know, every Sunday I have a quick chat to, to the editor about what I'm going to do, and he will he will suggest things that you know, I'm, I'm not really sure this is necessarily obvious to to a US audience the way it would be to a to a UK audience. But these are they're, they're pretty minor things. Fundamentally, you know, I write about what seems to me the the most interesting or the most important news line of that weekend, and um, and, and that's what comes out. Your background in writing is extensive and, and, and you're critically acclaimed. Uh, two of the books that I've read of yours um, were on Brian Clough. Um, Nobody Ever Says Thank You. I think that's what it was uh, uh, called. Yeah, that's right, yeah. yeah. And, and, and the Sunderland book about the 06 07 season uh, when Sunderland had been relegated with, a, at the time, a records low point total from the Premier League. Niall Quinn uh, and, uh, and, and Roy Keane come in. Um, Maybe maybe uh, uh, adversaries on the Irish national team a few years earlier, but uh, come in as a team to, to get Sunderland promoted. Um, th- th- those two works maybe didn't land uh, in the U.S. at the time, but my, my sense is the U.S. audience has evolved in the uh, the fifteen or twenty years uh, since those works were were, were, were published. 
and um, uh, Brian Clough is a household uh, 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 name now in the, in the United States. You have lots of uh, American uh, fans who make the pilgrimage to Nottingham or to Darby just to pose with the the the, the Clough statue and, and Clough and Taylor statues at at either ground. And uh, um, in terms of Sunderland, there's so much recognition of the club now because of. Um, that Netflix documentary, however tragic it was in terms of results. So um, have you found that maybe the U.S. audience is more mature now? I I don't know if that's the right word, but that's the word we'll use for lack of a better term, that it would have been, let's say, you had done this 15 or 20 years ago. Um, I mean, logically, it seems that 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 would be true. I I, I find that from the outside, it's very, very hard to judge. Uh, all I'd say would be that whenever I meet US fans over here, they're always incredibly well informed. But I guess the people who are bothering to make the trip to the UK to watch football, inevitably they're going to be the best informed, most passionate fans. Um, so I don't know. I, I think that question is is quite difficult to answer. I, I also think, I mean, that Sutherland book, it was very much written in a moment. Um, it was written very quickly because it, you know, it came about because of the promotion, which really was, wasn't obvious that was going to happen until um, sort of six weeks, two months before the end of the season. There was even really a possibility. Uh, so even for the UK market, that, that was, a, was a very sort of narrow window. I, I mean, I think if I were to do that book again, I'd focus a lot more on the links between Ireland and the North East. I mean, there's a lot of Irish immigration to the North East in the 19th century to work in the mines and the shipyards. I mean, part of my family was part of that diaspora. And that, I think, was an aspect they really didn't touch on at all, just because of the pace at which I, I wrote it. Clough, I think, is interesting. Because uh, that book, I, I don't think we sold it to any market other than the UK and Ireland market, um, which made me think at the time, maybe he's not quite such a big figure as we in, in England tend to think. Uh, I, I guess one of the reasons for that is he doesn't really have a tactical legacy. That, that His strength in management wasn't necessarily the tactical side. So if you're placing him in some kind of tactical family tree but it's not nothing really comes out of him which is not what you'd say of you know, certainly Shankly or Levy or, or um, your contemporaries of his uh, but this year uh, September is the 20th anniversary of his death and I think we are releasing a new edition of the book um, I'm working on an epilogue for that now so if any any US readers are interested in that there will be a new edition coming out um, I guess August time probably this year uh, probably a UK edition, but I mean, you know, it should be easy enough to get hold of. Yeah, and that's in fact uh, the Sunderland book. I got a UK edition um, in in two thousand seven. Yeah, so I mean, I'm pretty sure there's only a UK edition of that. So there's a, there's a friend of mine who goes to the US on holiday every year, and every year he goes through Chicago, and every year he went to the Barnes and Noble in Chicago, and every year he would take a photograph of the two copies of the Sunderland book they had on the shelf, and then suddenly three or four years ago, they weren't there anymore. Um, so either somebody went in and bought two copies or they just got rid of them, which I think is probably more likely. Another work of yours is Inverting the Pyramid, which I, I think is very mainstream, uh, not only in the U.S., but but all over the world. And you've published uh, multiple editions. And I, I've marked up my, my initial copy, the hardcover copy, so much that I've had to go and buy subsequent paperback editions so that I could just read uh, the book cleanly again. Uh, that gets into a lot of your background in covering Eastern European football, the ev- evolution of tactics um, and, and through uh, through the ninth, 1990s and, and 2000s. Um, as you see football tactics evolve even further the, since you wrote that that book, um, do, do you think that there is a a point in time where we're going to get back since we're talking about Clough um, a manager who's more into the psycho- psychological and, 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 and man management, so to speak, uh, as Clough certainly was, uh, than what we have now, which I think is just about every manager who's out there that's successful has some sort of tactical DNA or, um, or, or, or style associated with them, right? The, 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 the kind of old line man managers, they're not as successful anymore in football. Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, I, I, I think... Uh, we should be careful about saying that Clough didn't employ tactics. I think he did. He just conceptualised them in a different way. I don't think he was in any sense a theoretician. And I think you could t- talk for hours about his his and 
people like him uh, from English working class backgrounds, the, the sort of terror of intellectualism. I think Clough failed as 11 plus, which in UK at the time, when you were 11, you had an exam called 11 plus. If you passed it, you went to a grammar school, which was sort of academically minded. If you failed it, you, you went to um, a, a secondary school, which was much more vocational. Now, now that, that's all changed. But failing as 11 plus, when I, I think I'm right in saying every other one of his brothers, I think, I think he's also brothers and sisters, I think he's one of nine, all the other, it might, it might be one other failed, but I, certainly the majority of them passed. And that clearly left a scar on him. And I think his very vocal opposition to tactics, his refusal to discuss them, his refusal to go to um, Lillishaw, which was the, the equivalent of St George's Park now, the sort of big Mish National Academy, the, the, the National Coaching Centre, um, I think was born out of that. But then you, you hear specific things from, from games that, for instance, when Forrest played Liverpool in the, uh, let me get this right, the 77-8 European Cup, the away leg, and he said to Archie Gamble as he went out the dressing room, just play as a second right back today, we'll go with two right backs. And obviously, he didn't actually mean playing two right backs, he meant sit down deep. And it's very simple, but he had clearly conceived how he wanted the pattern of the game to look. And he could convey that with very specific instructions to individuals. He didn't need to draw out a huge schema. And I think his strength, or certainly his strength when he worked with Peter Taylor, he mentioned earlier, was he was very good at blending the squad, or you know, blending the team. Your squads would have been much smaller then, and working out players who would work well together, who'd be mutually complementary. And you look at the balance of his forest sides, they had Bill Anderson, a very attacking right back. Uh, you had John Roberts, who would play on the left wing almost as a playmaker, but they were compensated by either Archie Gamble or Mark O'Neill on the right of midfield being pretty defensive, so covering Anderson when he went outside them. And then you'd have Frank Clark, and then later Frank Gray at left back, who were very defensive, which compensated for the fact John Robertson didn't really track back. So there's, a, there's an internal balance to those sides. It wasn't that they just issued tactics altogether, it's just they, they were much more sort of uh, practical than, than theoretical. I think what you say is true, that we've, we're now in a very theoretical age, um, and I think there is a danger in that, that at times we sort of lose the, the man management aspect. We, we lose the sense of players as individuals, as humans with emotions and confidence and frailties and previous failure that haunts them. And all those aspects come together. And you know, certainly in English football, I think for a long time we were very much about passion, drive, desire. And it's possible that we've reset that counter too far. We're now far too focused on the theory. And something like Jurgen Klopp is clearly a master of both. And the best managers are masters of both. Uh, Pep Guardiola, I think, is maybe not as good as motivating players as Klopp. But equally, you see his ruthlessness, his decisiveness, um, you know, the, the way that he will ostracise a player who he feels is doing it. That is man management, but it's just more stick than carrot. Whereas Klopp, I think, the carrot and the stick are both there. So I think the best the best managers have both. Uh, it, it may be that in time we come back to a situation similar to what you had in Liverpool in the 60s and 70s, where you had the front man in Bill Shankly who didn't talk into the press, who was very charismatic, who was very good at, at, at pulling the fans together, getting the fans on board, very good at whipping up his team and, and inspiring them. And alongside him, somebody like Bob Paisley, who was the tactical genius, who'd work all of that out. And, and I think particularly as data becomes more and more involved and, and you, know, you have to be able to handle statistics, uh, I think we'll see those jobs maybe sort of diverge and you'll have the tactics guys, the boffins, who feed the information into the manager, who then processes that with the charisma to, to motivate players as well. Um, but yeah, I, I, think, I think the fundamental of the question is, is right, that I think possibly we have slipped away we have, have maybe lost sight of the emotional side of the game when I think the two together uh, are what are critical. Yeah, and that brings up another uh, point about management teams, right? You mentioned Shankly and Paisley, Clough and Taylor, uh, Mercer and Allison at Manchester City. That's another uh, famous one. Uh, th these days, it, it feels like um, 
backroom teams may be less uh, or, or less visible, but equally important. Um, the number twos for for some of these top managers are equally uh, important. And if you if you notice, Pep Guardiola always and Jurgen Klopp always has somebody there that they've worked with before and that shares their their stylistic vision for things, but that can also turn to them and say, "Hey, yeah, you need you need to fix this." Yeah, I, th- I think that's true, and, and um, I mean, I think Guardiola is really interesting. That he's got Armando Leo there, Leo, uh, who was a coach he clearly respected a lot when he was playing. Although he didn't work with him until his very last uh, stint as a player when he was um, in Sinaloa, Mexico, with Dorados. I know that's a really weird. I mean, that's a fascinating period of his career because he was there for six months. I think I might say they only ever won one game. They got relegated that season. And yet, somehow, that synergy of Guardiola and, and, and Leo have shaped European football since. Um, so, that, that, you know, that's one of those things I've always sort of got in the back of my mind that I really should go and find out what was going on there, <laughs> talk to some of the other players who were there. It just seems to be an amazing period. We sort of, and I've been guilty of this myself, of sort of glossing over it. Of, oh, yeah, Guardiola went to Mexico, they had this crazy work with Leo. And it's, yeah, but it went really badly wrong. <laughs> they weren't winning games. So why was it that that made him think, yeah, Leo is the guy who's, who's my sort of stylistic guru? Um, and you sort of get the impression it was almost a bit like a gap year or you know, a year out. That, uh, he, you know, he then, on a, before he came home, he spoke to Marcel Bielsa, he spoke to Cesar Luis Minotti, uh, he spoke to Ricardo Labolpe, two of them who were based in Mexico, and Bielsa in Argentina, um, sort of learning about his, his trade before he went back and, and got the Barcelona B job. Um so I think that is a fascinating time of his career, and it is interesting now that he's gone back to 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 Leo uh, as his yeah right hand man, his his sort of um, sounding board. And I think because of Leo's seniority, I, I think he would have no problems at all with, with talking back to Guardiola and saying, "No, no, I'm not sure that's right." Um, then it depends at the club, but I think often the the assistant is is important as a is a conduit between the manager and the players. If the players have a problem, they might be a little bit intimidated by going to the manager and saying, yeah, I'm not really sure this right wing is sort of helping me out at right back, or have you considered doing this? Or maybe the training schedule is a bit heavy and the lads are all a bit tired. Whereas you can go to the assistant manager and say, I don't know, do you, could you just sort of maybe raise this? And it, it's sort of, it, it's a very useful function of liaison. Um, but I, I think... I think the use of assistant managers is fascinating. Um, I mean, Klopp has had a big change in the last year or two, and a lot of backroom staff changed in Liverpool, which, when things were going badly last season, we all blamed. But I think you look at, look at say, Alex Ferguson and how often he changed his assistant. Every three or four years, he had a new assistant. But he had Steve McLaren, uh, he had Brian Kidd, he had Archie Knox, he had Carlos Kells, and you know, he cycled through them. And it was almost as if each new assistant he had was a new phase of his career that he, you know, he, he went through a new iteration of his thinking and that kept him fresh. And you compare that to, say, Jose Mourinho, his football to me now seems very old-fashioned. And there's this sort of sense, I think, of Mourinho as somebody very, very tough. You know, he, oh, he's a hard man. And actually, the truth is the opposite. I think in terms of drilling the players, I think he's really lax. And if you look at Tottenham, you look at Manchester United uh, under Mourinho, they were nowhere near as fit as the team, as, as the equivalent of those teams who, who came before and after. And that, I think, is fascinating. And I think that really Mourinho still maybe has something to offer because he is still so charismatic. If only he had a trusted assistant who could do the conditioning and nutritional work and make sure his teams are still really fit and could say to him, look, I think have you considered doing this? This is what modern coaching tells us to do and, and persuade it maybe to evolve slightly. So I think the role of the assistant is, is hugely important. And now it's not just about one assistant, it's about huge teams of backroom staff. And one of the problems when new managers take jobs is you always have these long negotiations about how many of their own staff are they allowed to bring in and to what extent they're going to have to plug into what's already at the club. And I think that is a really difficult um, process for the club to manage because obviously you don't want to be changing sort of you know six eight ten members of staff if you can possibly avoid it because it costs a huge amount of money and you would hope that your processes your structures 
are good enough. Um, and you, what, you, what you don't want is a manager, to, you, you clear out all your staff, a manager comes in, brings his staff, and then a year later, the results have got no better, and you have to get rid of it, and you're clearing out another dozen staff as well, and you're starting again. I think you want to believe that your philosophy is right, and that the, the basic process is there, all you need is a head coach to, to put that into practice. So I, you know, I think those are hugely important issues. Transitioning to um, a conversation, and, and this would be uh, we'll finish on this uh, about Marcelo Bielsa, who you admire, and uh, you were uh, accurate in in uh, uh, some of us thought that Frank Lampard might be a decent manager, and you were very accurate in uh, pegging from from the get go at Derby that Lampard uh, was flawed, and he had his he had his uh, uh, confrontation with Bielsa there, and obviously when Bielsa was at Leeds, and obviously Lampard has. Uh, fallen away as one of the uh, one of really kind of the, the most uh, uh, inadequate managers that we've seen in, in recent years in, in uh, the Premier League. Uh, Bielsa now is at Uruguay. And um, one thing I've found in the United States over the course of the last, um, I would say since Bielsa's stint with Chile, uh, maybe maybe uh, it, it was uh, when he went with uh, Bill Bow after that, but there are um, like... Uh, in other parts of the world, there are devotees to Bielsa and Bielsa's philosophy in the coaching ranks in the United States and in terms of um, people who, 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 who consume their football in a certain way. So um, as Bielsa's journey with Uruguay, which has started very well, um, unsurprisingly to me, uh, continues, is that going to be a theme you explore further in, in your newsletter? Because obviously you've got an incredible background in, in covering him and understanding uh, his philosophy may be better than than most writers in the English language, and um, he's now in, in an even more prominent and visible role uh, for an American audience. Yeah, I mean, the I think the news that's really bit technically is European football. I, I'm not quite sure how far I can push that. I mean, it tends to be very like, in focused anyway. But yeah, I mean, um, I, I I agree with you. I, it's not a surprise to me at all that Bielsa is doing well with Uruguay. I, I do. I wonder now whether his philosophy is better suited to national teams. Um, my my hesitation with that previously was always I thought it took time for him to bed his theories in, but I I, I've, I now have actually sort of slowly come to the conclusion that once you've had two or three weeks with him, they're probably not that difficult. The difficult thing is the physicality of it, um, because they're because they're very it's, you know it's a um, it's man to man. It's a man focused pressing system on the zonal system. I think that probably is easier to adapt to. I think when you do it at a club level, opponents work it out pretty quickly because they, they can watch you at least once a week, but often twice a week. And after a few months, it's sort of okay, we see the patterns. I think at national level, that's, that's much harder. Um, I think just the plays he's got at Uruguay, I think, suit his style. I mean, Nunez, I think, is the perfect forward for him. You know, will constantly run, will be this this physical totem, is great leading the line, doesn't mind you know, sprinting for 90 minutes, will put himself where it hurts, and you know, will create enough chances that he, you know, he'll, he'll get sort of a goal a game in the qualifiers at least. Um, but I also wonder whether Bielsa himself, just the fact that he doesn't have to do it every day, he doesn't have that, that incredible emotional fatigue that, that you see you see with him, I, th- I think that must help. And I think the other thing would be also, uh, I think one of the reasons I, I want to, it's not just the football, though the football is incredibly exciting to watch. It's the fact he's so obviously a man of great integrity. And that is so rare in football. Um, I think that should be celebrated. You know, he's very, very honest. Um, and he's also somebody who's genuinely incredibly intellectually curious. So, there's no sense of him saying, well, this is how I play and that's it. I'm not going to change it. He's got his basic principles and they haven't changed in 30 odd years. But he's constantly tweaking them. And, you know, he, he, there was a, when he, just after he taken the Uruguay job, he did this press conference where he's going on and on and on about creating a free man and getting him running into space and how this is the future. And you sort of think, yeah, this, this is clearly an idea that he's just had, that he's absolutely thrilled by and thinks there's huge potential in it. And whereas other managers might hide it away, he, he can't, he's so excited by it, he can't help but talk about it because he's such an enthusiast for football. 
So I think one of the one, you know, the, 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 the football is very exciting, but there's also just a sense of this is just a guy who he's a decent bloke, and there's there's not many of them in football. I, I actually have one more question, which is. Uh, the Premier League has become, I think, in, in my opinion, by far the most tactically varied league in, in the world. We used to say that about Serie A. Uh, at times, we could say that about La Liga or Liga. But now, uh, the Premier League, which often was derided by critics on the continent uh, 10, 15, 20 years ago as being uh, a kind of sale tactically, uh, you, you, you can uh, 20, 20 clubs, you might see 10 or 12 different styles on a given weekend. Um, why do you think that's happened? What, what, what has happened in English football culture uh, that you've seen this evolution of tactics uh, and tactical variety? You even see it in the championship a little bit. I remember when Chris Wilder had uh, uh, Sheffield United in the championship a few years ago. He he had a tactical wrinkle a lot of us hadn't seen before uh, the year they got promoted. So uh, something has happened in English football in, in the last decade or so uh, to change things. Yeah, I, th- I think there's two things that come together. So, so the first is money. Yeah, financially, <laughs> right, right, obviously. everybody else. Yeah. Has the, the, the Premier League just goes out and buys the best managers. And the best managers are the ones who have a clear tactical vision and they come to England and they, they tweak them slightly to the other circumstances, but they, they're imposing their vision and they're the best tactical thinkers. And so you have people like Iola going to Bournemouth. And Bournemouth are great to watch this season. And that wouldn't have happened 10 years ago. Clubs of the stature would not have been able to afford a coach of Iola's stature. Um, so it's partly that, and that then has a, you know, a, a knock-on effect. Uh, and because then you know, we're, we're seeing um, these very exciting things happening tactically in the Premier League, so, and, and often actually, to be honest, at a level that... It's very, very hard to know to understand what's happening. So I was at the game between Brighton and Liverpool back in the autumn, which was a two two draw, and all four goals came from a team trying to play out from the back, losing the ball, and the opposition I think one of the Liverpool goals might have been a penalty. Or maybe one of the, one of the goals was a penalty, I can't remember which way around it was. The other three were just you know transition and and, and score. So all four of them were, were goals that resulted in, in resulted from winning the ball back in the final third. And I think, yeah, 20, 30 years ago, it tends to have been to sort of say, wow, this is a hopeless game. All the, all the goals are from mistakes. Whereas now I think we can say, no, those are goals that have been provoked by clever pressing patterns. And just the, where the press box is at Brighton, you're right behind the benches. So you can see very clearly what's going on on the benches and in the technical areas. And what was apparent to me was that both managers would get very excited by something, would start screaming, waving their arms around, shouting at a senior player and then we sit down for five minutes and then the other one would be up and changing some and so you could almost see the chess match happening even though I didn't really recognise what the moves were I knew the moves were being made and, and the, the sense I had from that game was this was a game operating at an incredibly high level but I just didn't understand it um, and the two managers clearly you know, from their post-match comments they had both really enjoyed the challenge of that um, and so, you know, if you're having that happening, you know your league is good. Uh, but when you have a discussion of that, what what happens is I think coaches lower down the pyramid are encouraged to experiment and encouraged to um, try and express their own visions or try and learn from from those who are seeing in, in the Premier League. And alongside that, and I think this actually might be the biggest thing, is that even 15 years ago in English football if you went right down the pyramid, you went down to the 7th, 8th tier, the pitches were terrible. They, yeah. you know, it got to November, they were just mud. And they'd be ankle deep in mud or they'd be frozen. And if, you, if you're playing on that, or even more so if you're a kid learning to play on that, well, obviously, if you're a defender, you don't play the ball short, you don't play the ball out from the back, you don't play square balls across your goal because you can't rely on your first touch. And what has happened in the last 15 years or so is the enormous investment, um, I think largely caused by lottery funding, actually, rather than necessarily by the FA, but some FA mm. funding, uh, to improve the level of pitches. Uh, technology now with, with these sort of hybrid pitches that where you put in artificial fibres that keep the, you help the grass to, to, to remain strong, keep them flat, keep them level, stop them getting incredibly boggy. And so if you go now and watch 7th, 8th year football 
in England. Pictures are pretty good. Teams pass out from the back, partly because of what they're seeing on telly, it's what good players do, but partly because they can, because the pictures allow them to do it. And so if you're a kid of a you know, promising centre-back of 11 or 12-year-old, and you're growing up playing on that type of pitch all the time, why would you whack it long? Makes no sense. <laughs> you're confident in your first touch, so you will pass it to the fullback. you'll get it back, you'll knock it in the midfield, you'll take it back, and you're not worried about the ball bobbling and you being made to look an idiot and losing the ball and conceding a goal. And that has a huge shift in the mentality of football. It's not negative anymore. It's not, get the ball clear. It's, well, I've got the ball. What can I do with it? How can I, how can I be progressive in what I'm doing? Um, and I think that really is what's... I mean, it, it, it's sort of it's a microcosm of what's happened across football, but as pitches have improved, as you can take the first touch for granted, then the game becomes much more about strategy and about positioning than about just desperately trying to get the ball out of the danger, trying to sort of control it when it's bobbling about. That control is, is taken for granted now, and that means that you can be much more um, sophisticated in your, in your tactical outlook. And tell us where, uh, how, tell our listeners how they can sign up for your newsletter and where you can find it. Uh, so if you go on the Guardian website, uh, if you go on, on the sport or the football section, there's there's a banner there. Uh, it's called Soccer with Jonathan Wilson. If you sign on that, put in your email address, and it will land uh, in your inbox on well, it's three p.m. UK time. So I guess that's ten a.m. East Coast time in the US, and earlier the further west you are. Two hours before the Guardian's fiver arrives in our inboxes as well, uh, which is a legendary newsletter from the Guardian. Uh, thank you, Jonathan Wilson. No worries. Thank you very much.